everyone. Welcome here. Um, Alan from Truecaller. I know who you are. We've met on various occasions over the last few years. I know your company, but maybe not everyone in this room does. So can you give us a little bit of a basic description of what Truecaller is? Sure. So uh, we're a Stockholm-based company. Uh, me and my co-founder, we started the company back in 2009. And uh, Truecaller is basically a communication product. You can make phone calls and text messages directly from Truecaller. Um, and recently this year, we also launched payments. So you can pay directly from your contacts instead of Truecaller to your friends, like peer-to-peer -peer payments and so forth. And we mainly focus on emerging markets. Uh, we have over 250 million customers around the world, uh, growing with around 400,000 new customers per day, 100% organic. Cool. And we're going to talk more about that. But let's go back to 2009. And the question that I always like to ask is, why did you start this company? How did this come, come about? Like, why? Yeah, so um, you know, me and my co-founder, we started two other companies before Truecaller that obviously failed. Um, but during that period, we were both receiving a lot of phone calls from different parts of the world uh, within our work and, and um, you know, friends who moved abroad. And we were discussing this problem that you don't who is this person who's calling you? Like, how, how can I prioritize my time uh, by knowing who wants to communicate with me and what's the context of that? So we started to work on this product uh, and building it ourselves, uh, both front end and back end. And um, the first week when we launched it, we got 10,000 customers. And we were like, oh, damn, you know, we're not the only people who have this problem. And, so uh, from then, we decided to raise some angel capital and then resign from our full-time jobs. Yeah, because this is the type of product that if you launch it and you say, like, we do caller ID, it seems like a f more of a feature rather than a product. Obviously, that's not the case. Um, but you, you say you grew very quickly. Was that happening across uh, many markets? Or was it in Sweden first and then country per country? How did that happen? Yeah, so we, we saw growth coming from many markets. Uh, the, the problem in many of our markets was that there was no public data uh, available. Um, so we, we decided to build a community where people can contribute in different ways to, to make this work. And then it started to become this network effect where people wanted their friends to join. It was also a very magical experience uh, to be able to see who's calling me no matter where in the world the call came from. As, so, you know, it was more like, hey, I want to show you a magical thing. Just give me a ring. And we always, from the beginning, saw that, you know, the phone number is a unique identifier that connects you to the world. Now, there is a lot of data missing uh, about that person or that business behind that number. And if you can represent yourself in a much better way, then, you know, you will increase your business. Uh, you will increase your, um, you know, every... Every, every time you try to communicate with someone, you will sort of reach the success of it. All right. Um, you mentioned today I have 250 million users, which is insane. But I think it's even more insane that you're onboarding 400,000 users every single day, which is close to half a million a day. Yeah. Where are these users coming from? Where are these markets? <laughs> So interest, uh, it's very interesting. So our big markets are uh, India, Middle East, whole Africa, parts of Latin America, and parts of Europe. Um, but if you only look at our top 20 markets, those markets represent 2.2 billion people. And less than 30% of those countries, and in many of those countries, it's like less than 10% have, have a smartphone. So in the coming years, we'll see more and more people getting connected every single day. And I would say many of those 400,000 users that joins every day are people who, for the first time, bought a smartphone and got connected to the world. So the, the growth we're seeing today is nothing compared to what we'll be seeing in the coming two years. Was this something you expected? Because you're growing a lot in Africa, uh, across the Middle East, and India in particular. Was this something you expected when you started the company? Not really. I think we were, I mean, we were just focused on building a good product uh, every single day. And then all of a sudden, one, one uh, evening, uh, a friend of mine sent a video. He was watching the Lebanese news. And he said that uh, people are talking about you on the you know, main news channel. So he sent me the link. And uh, uh, Nami and I were looking at it. And we were like, shit, everyone is talking about true colors in Lebanon. What's going on? And when we started to look at the numbers, for some reason, we missed it. 
because we were so focused on just building the product. And, all, and we realized at that point that 60% of the population was using True Color. And it was a, it's a small population, so we, you know, it went so fast. So we started to backtrack it to figure out why did this happen, uh, and then find our key KPIs that made this possible, and then try to replicate it in more markets. Sure. Um, one thing that happens in this wonderful world of tech startups, when you have that kind of traction and a really good product, is that you tend to attract investors. Um, you've raised about $100 million so far for investors like Atomico, Sequoia, Kleiner Perkins. So not the small names, I would say, in investment. Um, how did that happen? So we've tried to, we've been close to bankruptcy uh, many times during these eight years, I would say. And uh, every time we tried to raise money, we failed. Uh, we were bad at selling the story. But every time we've raised money and been successful has been the times when they have knocked on our door. Right. And I think the data has shown that, okay, this is, this is something, this can become something big. So our first investor was uh, Sequoia. And it was the Sequoia India team that flew to Stockholm to meet us. And uh, we were pretty surprised because we tried to raise money from the local Swedish investors and they all, uh, you know, uh, denied us in some way. And so we asked them up front, why are you here? Why do you want to invest in us? And they said, you know, when you're using the product yourself every day, your wife is using it, your kids are using it, your neighbor is using it, and you're an investor but haven't invested, haven't invested in this company, then something is wrong. And we were like, okay, that makes sense. Write the check. And six weeks after they flew over to Stockholm, the money was in the bank. And that also shows the maturity of you know, the, the VCs like Sequoia, Atomico, and Kleiner Perkins, that they've done this many times in the past, and they know that the time of an entrepreneur is so important, don't waste it. Like, right. if, if you're committed, just do it. So I guess the secret is get as close to bankruptcy as possible and then let the investors come to you. Uh, I, I think it's really fruitful to be close to a near-death experience a few times. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's talk about the product a little bit. Um, what used to be relatively simple, calling ID, spam blocking, is now become a, a full-fledged communication product. Mm. Um, so what, what does TrueColor do today in a market like India, which is your number one market? Sorry, well, what is TrueColor? What, what, is, what is the product become now? Yeah. Is it messaging, it's payments? Right, so we, we believe that if we can apply our identity platform to your whole communication experience, everything from to your phone book, to your call history, where you might have you know, calls from people you don't store, uh, and also to your messaging, SMS messaging experience, then we can build a great communication tool. So that's sort of where it started from, and today you can manage your whole experience, uh, communication experience directly from TrueColor. And given our markets, what's really interesting is that in the markets we're big in, people don't save contacts into their phone book anymore. They just rely on everything being in the cloud, being managed by TrueColor which is a great lock-in as well, because you know, that keeps users engaged and retained for a long time, just like the browsers work, I would say. Right. Um, but it also pits you against, you know, there's, there's a lot of companies in this space, communication, messaging, payments, and it pits you directly into some of the biggest companies in tech. Is that the intention, like going full out and being competitive to you know, the Amazons and the Google of this world? Well, you know, um, we are competing with the big guys in, in many fields. Um, obviously, we're solving a problem that they are not doing since we're growing as fast as WhatsApp in our markets. Um, and we're the third most downloaded and engaged app in India after Facebook and WhatsApp. So we're, we're solving the trust part of communication, which no one else is really doing. And um, I don't see any other competitors looking at the world the same way that we do, that, for instance, payments, as you mentioned, from TrueColor in India, you can actually send money to your friend directly from your contacts. Uh, or after a conversation, you can send money to the person, even if you don't have that phone number stored in your contacts. And the way we look at it is that in most cases, when you send money to someone, there's a conversation happening before that. E either if you're buying something on a classified website or from a business. And keep in mind, in our market, markets, things go so fast, you don't send an email. If you want something to happen, you have to call them or you have to send a text message. Not just one, like 10, because that's how fast it's moving. Uh, and that's where TrueCall makes a lot of sense. And I don't see any other competitors doing or looking at it the same way as we do, even though they're trying to you know, 
step into it, but um, it, it's great to see competition coming in because that means we're doing something right at least. Right. So going back to the last eight years, uh, when you scale a company like TrueCar, it's never linear. There's ups and downs. Uh, so what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced over the last eight years, and how did you overcome them? Um, well, one of the big challenges we had was that, so me and my co-founder, we built the back-end infrastructure from the beginning. And uh, we were so afraid of letting other people work on it, um, which was you know, a, a good learning curve for us. But in 2014, we started to see like, strong exponential growth. And every week, we had like two, three downtimes. Um, and uh, you know, the servers went down for a couple of hours because the machines had to reboot the databases and so forth. So eventually, we said to our CTO, like, Dude, we know you've been complaining about uh, the backend infrastructure and you want to take, take it over. So please do it now. So we just handed over everything. And it took us a, a year to rewrite the whole infrastructure. And since then, we basically never had a downtime. Uh, and we're like 10x bigger than we were three, four years ago. Uh, so that was, um, I think, if we would have waited one more year to refactor everything, I don't think we would have made it. Could have been problematic. Yeah, um, sure. What are some of the other mistakes? Like, have you ever like focused really on a, on a new feature or product that was completely, um, you know, the wrong decision to make? Have you ever gone through downsizing or to lay off people? Like, what are some of the the other problems that you faced? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think one of the thing I reflect a lot on is um, we used to have three apps. We had TrueCaller, TrueDialer, and True Messenger, and we built TrueDialer as the phone app to sort of learn and understand the market a bit more. Same with True Messenger on the messaging side. And I think we waited a bit too long to merge them into TrueCaller. Um, and it created a lot of um, deep focus in the organization. Because it's, it's really hard to think about one product every single day when you wake up till you go to bed. But thinking about three products makes it even harder. And um, some of our advisors, entrepreneurs, they were giving us this advice, like, you should, you should merge it as soon as possible. It's really hard to manage several products. And we were like, no, 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 we can do it. You know, no problem. Um, and in hindsight, I, you know, they were right, uh, for sure. And these are pretty experienced people from you know, Facebook and so forth. Um, this focus on emerging markets, India, Africa, Middle East, would you advise other entrepreneurs to take closer looks at this market? Does it really depend on the product that you have? I, I definitely think that uh, companies in, in Europe should start looking at those markets because I believe that uh, companies in Silicon Valley, they live in a bubble. They don't really understand these markets yet, which is great for, for us because we can just land grab. And that was our strategy back in the days because everyone was focusing on the Western world. And we said, you know what? Um, the emerging markets will continue to emerge. They will become 10x bigger than the, the Western markets. So let's just focus on them while we can. And then in 2015, uh, Google and Facebook went out saying, we're going to focus on the next billion markets. This is where the future is. And then all of a sudden, everyone was looking at those markets. And we became very attractive all of a sudden. Right. Um, as one of our board members uh, usually says, like, growing in India used to be a bug back in the days. Now it's a feature. Uh, so uh, in hindsight, I think we took some good uh, decisions. Right. Great. How much of your time do you still spend in Stockholm? Sorry? How much of your time do you still spend in Stockholm? Most of my time. Um, so we have a, you know, a team of 20, 25 people in India right now. So I'm spending you know, one or two weeks every other month in India. Um, so most of my time is in Stockholm. But then, of course, you, know, you, you travel from time to time for other stuff as well. And you've, you've had two failed startups. You have a scale up. Do you get involved in the Stockholm startup ecosystem to pass on your learnings to you know, emerging entrepreneurs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's our uh, responsibility to do that. I mean, we've spent eight years building a, a network, trying to get in, you know, in front of John Doerr, who's on our board, and, and some other great people. Now, now that we have that relationship, how can we make sure that other great entrepreneurs in Stockholm can leverage that? So, you know, me and my co-founder, we co-invest in, in a few companies, and we try to find companies um, that are similar to us, like engineers, uh, engineering founders, 
who like to get, get their hands dirty, just like Mark Pincus was saying, in the product. Uh, so we've done a few investments uh, in, in Stockholm. Right. And what do you see some of these beginning entrepreneurs, when you look at them and you decide if you want to be an angel investor in their company, what, what are some of the mistakes you see them make that you can uh, advise them not to as an experienced entrepreneur? Sorry, I'm going to move here. It's hard to hear you. <laughs> uh, what do you see? What are some of the mistakes that you see emerging entrepreneurs make most often when you decide to invest or not? Well, what I see right now in Stockholm is a lot of there are a lot of great people and a lot of entrepreneurs who want to start a company. Uh, the, the big trap I see is that they spend too much time uh, at the different entrepreneur or startup events than actually sitting Coming down. Coming to Slush, for example. Yeah. yeah, like Slush, you know, what are we doing here? <laughs> so spending too much time uh, here than actually sitting and coding. We were super under the radar the first three, four years. No one knew about us. We didn't want people to know about us. We were only focusing on our own thing. And that's the advice we usually give back. Um, I think these, so there's a lot of uh, hubs that have started in Stockholm, like incubators which is a great initiative. The problem I see with those is that it's also a place where you hang out and talk to people. So you, we were working in, in uh, Nami's kitchen the first you know, 12 months, uh, and the other two, three years, we, were, we had an office in a basement. So no one could disturb us. Uh, you know, and it also fitted our budget as well. But it was, you're sort of locked in, and I think you need to be that. Yeah. Um, we talked about the product a little bit. Um, what we didn't talk about is that you're actually turning TrueColor into a platform mm. where essentially you offer an SDK to third-party application developers to use TrueColor. In what way? So the, the problem that many developers have is that when they onboard their customers, they churn a lot of users, um, mostly because OTP verification doesn't really work that well, or you need to build like a huge platform for that. And we spend a lot of time building that infrastructure to authenticate customers. So we, we built TrueColor SDK, which is just a small piece of code that you put into your app, and then you, know, you can single sign on your customer, just like you can do with Facebook login or Google. But the difference is, when you sign in your customers using our SDK, you get their phone number, you get verified information about the customer uh, that they have put into their TrueColor profile and that we have verified. Um, so you get more information about the customers when you onboard them. So this is sort of the first step in the TrueColor SDK uh, roadmap to authenticate the customers. The next step, of course, is how can we leverage other things that we've built in TrueColor into our SDK, like payments, for instance. Right. Uh, so we have around 150 developers using our uh, TrueColor SDK. Um, one of them are Times Internet Group on all their 40 properties, which is a huge business. Uh, Red Bus, which is the largest bus ticketing company in India. So um, when you want to buy a bus ticket, uh, you know, you download the app, uh, you sign in with TrueColor, so you know, the Red Bus company knows that you are who you say you are. And then you know, when you want to buy the ticket in the future, you should be able to utilize our SDK as well for that. All right. And one integration that I really uh, want you to talk about as well is the one with Amazon and Uber in India for mm -hmm. last mile delivery. Mm -hmm. How does that work? So we. Uh, it was actually this, earlier this year, we launched uh, TrueColor Priority because we saw that the problem that many of these del delivery type of companies have in India is that when the Uber driver calls you or the Amazon delivery guy calls you, n you might know it's those guys because TrueColor says it's Uber calling or it's Amazon calling, but you don't really know the context of it or how important the call is. So we launched the TrueColor Priority program so that those big companies can um, feed us with the phone numbers of all their delivery guys or drivers. So when they call, you will know and we will say, this is a verified call from Uber. It's the driver. He's, he, he's, he's, he's probably waiting for you. So adding even more context to the communication before it even happens. And we've seen all those customers uh, increasing the number of uh, deliveries, um, picked up drivers, etc. just rocket. Right. Well, sounds to me like you're onto something with the platform there. Um, happy scaling. Thank you. Thank you.